This is what I hope we get covered here this afternoon. Uh, we're going to talk about NMC and NMC2 zero-hit setups. That's the ZH. And I've got a question mark up here for whether or not we're dealing with multiple time frame. That is, multi-time frame zero hits. Now, are we talking about simultaneous or embedded zero hits from multiple time frames or from a single time frame only? And, and then I'm also, I'm also here mentioning cross-kiss versus continuation because there is a difference in those signals. You can have a cross-kiss, that is where NMC or NMC2 has been above or below zero for a long duration of time, makes its initial crossover and then comes back and does the zero hit kiss. Or whether it's just another of the bounces along the way. And we'll look at several examples of both. The entry signal. Once we've got a setup, we've got to have an entry signal. Without an entry signal, we have no trade. So we're going to talk about what the entry signal is, what it looks like in all of its variations, and how you then place a trade. It's a violation of the high or, or low. That's H or L. So I'm talking about a violation of the high or low of the bar, which will become apparent as we start seeing examples. Then I talk here about initial stops. And the initial stop is an opposite violation of this high or low. In other words, what we're hoping for, and, and this too will become apparent when you start seeing the charts, we're hoping we've identified a pivot, high or low, depending on whether or not we're trying to sell or buy. And if that is the case, and we've been successful with a zero hit, and that's what it proves to be, then our risk is by and large almost always going to equal the range of a single bar. By reducing risk to the range of a single bar, what that lets us do is to choose a time frame that is equal to our dollar risk tolerance levels. If we know that we can place a trade almost every time from a zero hit entry, where the risk we have to assume to take that trade is the range of a single bar, and again this will become quite apparent as we start going through examples, then it lets you dial in the time frame where the dollar range of bars on average is equal to just about the dollar risk that you can afford to take on a trade. TF is time frame. Time frame selection to equal dollar risk tolerance. Then we're going to talk about possible bet strategies. I'm not going to get into that right now, but, but remind me as we're going through this, because this is going to need to be erased in a little bit, remind me to talk about bet strategy and how we can use three units here to ensure that many, many times, worst case, we're going to get out of a trade on the total commitment or campaign that we're using is going to be scratch. We're then going to talk about add-on trades and hidden add-on trades as they relate to NMC and other Ocean tools as well. And then some of... Uh, not limited to, but some of the supporting information that we can glean from other ocean tools that help us on the selection of these zero hits include these. NMMROC stands for Rate of Change Slingshot. That, that too will explain. Another is the NMS and its relative position to one or both of its ocean moving averages. We looked at NMS yesterday. We have not looked at this rate of change but we will. And whether or not NMS is supporting the buy or sell being delivered to us from an NMC or an MC20 hit with an entry signal. Thirdly, we're going to look at uh, ocean moving average support and resistance at the time of the zero hit to see whether or not that is also adding to the validity of the trade and whether or not at the time of the zero hit there might be a band pinch taking place from the ocean moving averages and their standard deviation bands, which might help increase the likelihood that the size of the trade is abnormally large if we're coming out of a band pinch, for instance. Not only more ballistic and, and faster with more velocity, but also larger. These are helpful additions, and, and I don't mean to this to be a limiting thought process here, because there are many other tools that you can bring to bear. These are just a few of them. And really, I wrote, I wrote this as much for any other reason so that you can kind of fill in the blanks and say, you know, do I understand this and this and this and this? 
and to remind me and to jog my memory as we're going through these examples that all of this gets covered because if this all gets covered then you've got a pretty good grasp of what we're doing with NMC. Question, Stephen? Can you also ask us to remind you about spreads? Yes, spreads. we probably will not get to spreads today and how they can be applied, but you've got inputs in the ocean tools and you don't have to limit yourself to close. Uh, you, you can use spread calculations in there. All right, I guess our first step will be to go back to the machine and let's look at one on the computer and then we'll go to the whiteboard and look at some of the very various variants that can occur from that. All right, I'm using Genesis now. We're moving from Trade Station over to Genesis because I wanted to show something fairly significant as our very first example. And what I want to what I want to point out uh, first is that we've seen NMS and it's two MAs. <coughs> this is NMS down here. This is the NMM <coughs> rate of change, which I'll describe in just a minute. And now in the top subgraph, we're looking at NMC and NMC 2A. These are the two NMC tools. I've also added the ocean moving average up here on price. And this is a case where NMC is another one of the oscillators that oscillates above and below zero. In this case, this is the zero line. They're both well, uh, the NMC 2A is above zero. The NMC is, as of this most recent bar, trading on zero. This is the way it'll look to you on the bleeding right hand edge of a screen. So you're coming down into the support of the ocean moving average, and NMC is doing a zero hit. I'm doing a zero hit. Now that does not mean we blindly go in and enter on a zero hit. I've, had, I've tried to explain this as ad infinitum until the point I think I'm boring people. And yet I've had people get home and say, well, you just can't take those zero hits because they'll beat you all day long. And I say, yes, didn't I tell you a dozen times that was the case? You know, you've got to trip an entry. The market has got to prove to us it's moving in the direction that we anticipate that it's going to. So here is a zero hit taking place. Now, on the next bar, notice that NMC now bounces off of the zero line. It could have remained on the zero line, but in this case it bounces off of the zero line. On the zero hit bar right here, here's what's going to happen to us. We're coming down, NMC has been above zero, and does a zero hit. At that moment, the high of that bar becomes our potential entry price. This is not the only way you can trade this. This is one of the ways I suggest you begin learning to trade it. The high of this bar becomes our potential entry price. Now on the next bar, NMC can do another zero and just make a flat line. In the event that that happens, what typically is going to occur is one of two things. Either this high is going to be violated or it is not. NMC could also move up off of the zero line and the same situation could occur. The main thing here is if we make a lower high and NMC has not negated the trade by dropping below zero, and this is important, if it drops below zero, the potential for the trade is now negated. That was simply a crossover, not a zero hit with a bounce. This initial zero hit bars high if we're above zero, we're looking at the high for a buy signal. Conversely, if we were below zero, we'd be looking for the low violation for a sell signal. But in this case, we're looking at the high for a possible buy signal. Now, if the next, if, if NMC does not negate the trade by dropping below zero, we're going to, and we make a lower high on the next bar, we're going to move our potential entry price from this bar's high to this bar's high. Now, under a scenario like that, as soon as we take that out, the entry is the high of that bar. Another variant that could have occurred is NMC is still in a position to support the potential trade, and we make another lower high. 
We're not, we're not concerned with the location of the lows, only the highs. We make another lower high. NMC, NMC still permits the trade. If that were the case, as soon as we take out that high, we have a valid entry signal. And this is really important because let's say this close were way up here on the zero hit bar. I don't want to enter there because I'm already underwater. And in fact, it's very possible that I do something like this, NMC drops through the bottom, and that occurs. I never had an entry signal using this rule. And we're going to see multiple examples where this rule will keep you out of a lot of trades that otherwise would have tripped you in. It, no, as long as NMC permits the trade. As long as NMC stays above zero, and zero bid is considered, is considered open and valid. Okay. Open and valid. Okay. All right, on this chart, I'm doing a zero hit right here. Given the rules that I've just described, and that bar occurs, did I get an entry signal? The high of this bar and I don't know whether you'll be able to see this or not, but up here in the corner, it's actually available here in the data window as well as up here. The high of this bar is 904 even. The high of the next bar is 888.90. If I don't have a valid entry already, and we're sure I don't, is that correct? Where would the entry be for the next bar? 88.90, right? Did I get an entry now? Okay, so we're now long this market from 88.90. Notice that the open of this bar right here on the end was within the range of the potential bar that was going to be our entry tripping bar. Had there been a gap there, potentially the risk and reward would have been stilted, which I'll describe in just one second. And we might have passed on the trade simply because of that kind of price activity. At the time we take this trade, the stop, and I need to go back to the whiteboard again, at the time of the zero hit, this was our potential buy stop. The next bar made a lower high so that becomes our potential entry price. When that violation occurs, we go long this market. Now, what we are hoping here is that this bottom back here has become a pivot low. In this example, there was only a one bar setback off of the high, but many times you'll see a market go up, come down for three or four bars. This is the one that produces a zero hit, and we take back off that is going to make for the pivot low that we're hoping will hold and therefore is going to be our stop. So what we're going to end up doing at the moment we place this trade long right here, we're going to place an initial protective stop right underneath that low. And in doing so, what we have done is limited our risk to the range of a single bar. In this case, we generated an entry that was in a, from a bar that was inside the prior bar. So the range is actually a bit more than a single bar, but the typical formation that you're going to see out of this is more of something like this, where you'll come down for another bar. Uh, you've made it, let's say, a potential entry here. Now you make a lower high potential entry. Now you take it out, you get entered there. That pivot low right there is what we're hoping is going to be a point that the market holds, and that becomes our stop level. And in that case, the range of the bar is precisely the risk we have to assume. Therefore, what this is going to allow you to do most of the time is to find a time frame where the average range of the bars matches what your trading account will allow you to take in terms of risk. If we're talking about trading monthly bars, the risk could be twenty or thirty thousand dollars. If we're talking about a five minute bar, the average range of the bar could allow you to take a trade with a risk of two hundred dollars. 
or less. William, we've had examples where signals have occurred on as high a time frame as daily or weekly, and you roll down and can end up placing a trade for the risk of a one minute bar in the direction of what that daily or weekly signal was telling you. So this is a real important concept where this initial stop is placed. It's more important than the profit potential. What am I going to lose when I'm wrong? The profits will ultimately take care of themselves if I can deal with this. In fact, in the market, this is the only factor that I can deal with. Everything else is up to the market gods. Only this is within my power to control. Now, I made a comment a second ago about what might happen in the event of a gap. Let's say that the market closes here and gaps open here and just takes off. What do I do then? Well, if my expectation was that this low is going to end up being a pivot low here in the market, I know that this trade is not going to go to the moon forever. So two things have happened to me. One, as a result of this distance of the gap, the potential profit that I could have exploited has been diminished because I wasn't in that trade to be able to take advantage of that. And number two, my risk now comes, becomes not the range of a bar, but the distance from there all the way down to that low. So, so I've been hammered on two fronts. One, it's, it's taken away profit potential from me when a gap occurs, and second, it's added to the risk I have to assume to take the trade. So this may be a situation, and we'll see some of these, where you simply walk away from the trade even though everything else looks right because the risk-reward relationship has now been stilted against you. Question. Uh, yeah, Pat, I, I can see what you're saying, let's say this is on daily or on weekly or yada yada, but we get down to one minute, three minute, or five minute, that gap, while it exists, may be a very small amount. So That's then that's correct. Uh, the question was, at, at very low time frames, should that negate a trade? Now, obviously, if I'm looking at a gap like this on a one-minute bar chart, and I'm taking this because of a weekly signal, I'm not going to let that be enough to put me out of the trade. Yes. I mean, you've got to use some common sense here and ask how much profit potential exists. See, that's the beauty. If I'm dealing from a weekly chart, the profit potential is probably 30 times greater than it would be off a single time frame of, say, one minute. All right, we're back looking at our example now. We're dealing with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. These are yearly bars. Every bar represents an entire year of price action. And in this example, this is the year ending December 31st, 1974. This was the first buy signal of the bull market that began 30 years ago. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. See? Now, we entered that market, remember, at a price above 888.90. Here's where the bull market that we all know and love took off from, which was 1982. And by 1991, 10 years later, prices were trading above 3,000. So there's a buy signal off of a yearly chart where prices have tripled. And as we come forward in time, this is where we stand right now. Interesting. So the, the first and only, given the data that I have right here, that there isn't enough data from yearly bars to get a lot more, but you had a buy signal from a yearly bar out of NMC in 1974 to get long at 888.90 with an initial stop at the low of that bar, which would have been 570. That's a huge risk, of course. But in exchange for the fact that the market has gone up 12-fold from there, the risk-reward was excellent on this trade. Now, 
we'll get into some of the specifics here about other formations that we like about this trade. At the time of this zero hit, and notice by zero hit out of NMC, and I'm looking, I'm looking right here on the chart, notice that we can see the value. NMC is zero, and the standard deviation calculation will always, if NMC is producing a zero hit, the code has been written such that the NMC calculation will also be zero as well. And that's what produces that little sawtooth in the standard deviation dash line that you see. First point that I want to make about this, uh, well, you tell me. We'll see whether or not le yesterday's lessons worked out. Uh, we talked about the moving average yesterday. Are prices finding support from the ocean natural moving average shown in magenta? The fast ocean moving average is in green, and it's just now being able to plot because there wasn't enough data prior to that. Again, these are yearly bars, but there wasn't enough data prior to that to be able to get a, a plot from it. So. Prices have come down to the ocean moving average. We're doing a zero hit out of an MC. Prices are finding support at the ocean moving average. We talked yesterday about the relative position of NMS to its two ocean moving averages. This is not an ideal scenario here, but it's not necessary that it be present. It's just one of those helpful signs that things are likely to work out in your favor. What is nice about this trade is this NMMROC and its location. It's an oscillator just like other oscillators that, that we've been looking at based on ocean. That is, it oscillates above and below the zero line. What the NMMROC is, is a rate of change oscillator of NMM. Very short term and arbitrary. We have arbitrarily chosen a three bar look back here for NMM. So we're calculating a three bar rate of change of NMM. It is not a tool, it is arbitrary and not a tool you want to use for a lot of other things except for identification of things like divergences and of being in an oversold position at the time of a buy setup for NMC or an overbought position at the time for a sell setup out of NMC. And we talked at length about an oscillator, any of the ocean oscillators being above or below their upper or lower standard deviations. In this case, the ROC oscillator is, is down here below its negative standard, this is the zero line, it's below its negative standard deviation, that is, it is spring loaded, it's telling us that the market on a very short term basis is spring loaded for a move to the upside. Conversely, by the time we get over to this bar right here, it has gone to its upper standard deviation. That does not mean this move is over. We're, we're using this tool primarily to tell us whether or not we have a spring-loaded slingshot position from this oscillator at the time of the zero hit, which should imply an accelerative move coming out of the hole for a buy signal. Vertical cursor is right there at the time of the zero hit. There is another bar that has yet to provide an entry, and it is at its lowest point. Is that one or two standard deviations? It's two standard deviations. You have the ability to alter that as you choose. Now at the time where there finally is an entry, the rate of change tool has turned up and again, this is not, it's not cast in stone that you must use this. This is another one of those confirming pieces of information that's quite helpful. Notice that throughout, and I get into a scaling issue because there's been so much price movement here, but notice that throughout the move from the time we got long this market on this bar right here, we certainly never go below the regular ocean moving average, and in fact the fast ocean moving average tracks underneath, the fast ocean moving average is shown in green and is tracking underneath the bars quite well, containing prices. Why do you need to use Genesis here instead of TradeStation? I can't build yearly bars in TradeStation. And I just, what I wanted to point out here is it doesn't matter where we're talking about one minute bars, 
or annual bars. The tools work the same way. Genesis has a lot of attributes that are not present in TradeStation. There is the ability to build yearly bars as well as quarterly bars as well as any custom time period that you yeah. want to. Don't let the relative position of NMS and its two ocean moving averages spook you out of a trade and don't let the fact that you do not have a slingshot formation out of the NMMROC spook you out of a trade. Because as you can see, NMS looked miserable in relation to its two moving averages at this point and yet it began a 30 year bull market. Ideally, we would like to see NMS trading above both its moving averages and the fast moving average having crossed the slow moving average all headed to the upside at the time of the zero hit from above for a buy setup. But it is not imperative that that be the case. Okay, so that's the annual chart. Now, I'm going to roll down to a quarterly chart. And again, this will, let's see, this Go back to the yearly one more time. That was the year ending December 31st, 1974. Anytime you've got a question about the date, there'll be two places you can see it. One is over here in the data window and down here as well. So at the end of December 2000, uh, uh, 1974, we were doing an annual zero hit. Now I'm going to roll down to a quarterly chart. Here's the way the quarterly chart looked the end of December 1974. Now your NMCs were not giving you setups here. That too is not imperative that you have one at every single time frame. We're talking about a yearly trade here. And in fact the first time, let's see, the first time we actually get, a, and this is important as well, the first time we actually get a zero hit out of NMC on a quarterly chart is the crash of 1987. And where did prices come precisely down to to find wow. support? Yeah. The ocean moving average. So while everyone else was petrified during the crash of 87, we're saying I'm firmly ensconced in a yearly chart bull market. And at the quarterly level, all I've done is a retracement that's produced a zero hit from above for another buy signal entry. Now, we talked about risk. Given our entry rule on the zero hit bar, our entry, at, if that were the only piece of information that we had available to us, i.e. at this point right here, where I look up and see that NMC is doing a zero, and I've just come crashing down in the fourth quarter of 87, my entry has to be up here above 2662 and I closed at 1938. That market is going to have to go almost 700 points higher to give me an entry. I may walk away from that trade even if it trips an entry on the next bar. That is first quarter of 88 because the risk is too large because the range of that bar that was a setup bar for a zero hit was too large and you will see this over and over and over again as well. And it turns out then, do we have an entry on this bar? Where would our entry price be? High of that bar? Well the next one, this one. Everyone agree that the high of that bar is 21.10 and would be our entry price for the next bar? Yeah. And if that were the case, where would our stop be placed? The low of the previous bar, which we would be hoping to become a pivot. As of this moment, that's all we know. And this is where we would attempt to place a stop, is underneath 16.38. This is the logical place to have placed a stop, is underneath that low, if we trip an entry. At the time of that potential entry, how do the other tools look? The ancillary tools that we talked about yesterday, including this NMM rate of change that we just introduced a few minutes ago. I heard a comment that there was a slingshot forming. You see that? Everyone sees that the rate of change oscillator has now pegged below its negative SD. 
NMS now is in a different position than what we looked at at the weekly level. It's, it's broken through a little bit of the support of the fast ocean moving average, and in a perfect world, not even that would have happened, but it has still got the support of the regular ocean moving average, and, and the fast ocean moving average is traveling above the regular moving average. So the, what's the word, the dispersion between these is the way I like to see it, fast above the regular and NMS above the, at least the regular and preferably above them both. Now, did we get an entry on that bar? Since we took out the high of this bar right here at 21.10, we're now long this market with a stop underneath this low of 16.38. And as Larry would say, no worries, mate. Right? <laughs> there was a near zero hit, and if we roll down to a low, again, I'm in a bull market by, by all measurements again now. And what I'd like, you know, what I would normally do in a case like this is I'd roll down to a lower time frame to see if I can make that be what I want it to be, which would be another potential entry signal. So we've got the mechanics of the buy signal down pretty well. No, notice here how well the regular ocean moving average and fast ocean moving average are containing prices now and providing support underneath it. These are quarterly bars, yes. Anyone see any problem with this market now? I mean, everything so far looks fairly good. Notice that a market makes a lot more sense, typically at very high. The reason I started with a yearly bar and now I've rolled down to quarterly bars, I don't expect anyone in here, by and large, to be trading those. When a market appears insane, move to a higher time frame. The big money is not playing in a one-minute bar chart. And the places where the big money is playing is where sense will prevail.